The War of the Worlds was first published as a novel in 1898. Written by English author H.G. Wells, the story of alien invaders had already gained popular appeal when it had been serialized by Pearson's magazine in the UK and by Cosmopolitan magazine in the US in 1897. The publication of the novel, however, and its translation into multiple languages saw that success spread internationally, firmly establishing Wells's reputation as a pioneer in the relatively new and unexplored genre of science fiction. The novel details a catastrophic conflict between humans and extraterrestrial Martians, whom we are told in the book's now legendary opening monologue, regarded this Earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. Arriving without warning, the invaders immediately set about ruthlessly conquering the Earth, utilizing shock and awe tactics with technology far superior to any of man's defenses. These include heat rays and large mechanical tripods or fighting machines that bring about total destruction, seemingly without moral limitations. Coupled with the Martians' attack is the appearance of an invasive red weed, which like the aliens themselves, triumph over the environment, seemingly in a bid to terraform the planet. When all hope seems lost, however, the tide is suddenly and unexpectedly turned as the Martians and the red weed begin to wither and die, their biology succumbing to bacterial infection. Thus, ultimately, the Martians are defeated by what Wells describes as our microscopic allies, concluding with the memorable lines, By the toll of a billion deaths, man has bought his birthright of the earth, and it is his against all comers. It would still be his were the Martians ten times as mighty as they are. For neither do men live, nor die in vain. Considered a landmark work of science fiction, the story in its original form has never been out of print, and it has inspired numerous adaptations and imitations over the decades. With each new generation able to draw upon the essence of the story, but adapt it to fit their own time and place. The most famous of these being the infamous Orson Welles 1938 radio play, a film version in the 50s, a highly successful concept album by musician Jeff Wayne, and Steven Spielberg's 2005 film adaption starring Tom Cruise. But what is it exactly about a science fiction novel published well over a century ago that has resonated with audiences for so long? And how has it remained relevant in an ever-changing world in a genre whose individual works typically do not age very well at all. In this video, we thought we would take a deep dive into this most remarkable novel. Emerging during the last years of the 19th century, at the tail end of the Victorian era, The War of the Worlds was published during a period of tremendous social and technological change. Unmatched in any other period in human history, other than maybe our own. In fact, it is impossible to fully appreciate the novel without understanding the historical context in which it emerged. Placing its publication on a timeline and looking at what happened leading up to it, you begin to get a feel for the spirit of its time. Beginning in the 1840s and continuing through the Victorian era, we see a massive rollout of the railway network changing forever both the social patterns and the landscape of Britain. On May 24th, 1844, Samuel Morse sent his first telegraph message, utilizing Morse code with the message, What hath God wrought? 1859, we see the publication of Charles Darwin's landmark book, On the Origin of Species, detailing his revolutionary theory of evolutionary biology. In 1866, a durable telegraph cable was laid across the Atlantic, connecting North America and Europe, with the network soon expanding globally. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell develops the telephone. 1881 sees the first street in London lit with electrical arc lamps. 1878, Thomas Edison patents the first practical incandescent light bulb. On January 29, 1886, Carl Benz applied for a patent for his vehicle powered by a gas engine. 
1893, Nikola Tesla amazes the world by illuminating the world's fair. Dubbed the City of Light, it establishes AC current as the standard for electrical devices moving forward. In 1895, the arrival of the train is shown to an audience giving the public the first glimpse of moving pictures and with it the birth of modern cinema. 1896, Marconi demonstrates his system of practical radio transmissions establishing the foundations for global communication system of the 20th century. So, you can see just how much of a significant time it was in terms of social and technological change, and why, if for nothing else, the genre of science fiction captured Victorian imagination. Of these events, it can be argued that the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species had the most profound impact on society. It certainly did on Wells, who prior to his career as a writer trained as a science teacher. At one point, studying under famed biologist and staunch advocate of Charles Darwin's theory, Thomas Henry Huxley. The origin of the species and the theory of evolution upended the way human beings thought about where they came from and challenged millennia of religious dogma shaped by the ideological framework known as the Great Chain of Being. This view of the world, which originated during the Middle Ages, saw all of creation existing within a universal hierarchy that stretched from God, or immutable perfection, to angels, to men, to animals, to vegetables, and finally minerals. As a result of this hierarchy, creatures and things on a higher level were believed to possess more authority over lower ones. Plants, for instance, were believed to have authority over the minerals in the soil. Consequently, they had God's sanction to draw nutrients from the earth and grow upon it, while the minerals and soil existed to support plants. Humans, in turn, were believed to possess greater attributes than animals. Thus, it was proper for them to rule over the rest of the natural world. Darwin's theory of natural selection challenged all of this, explaining how living forms change and evolve over time and thus are not immutably ordained particularly troublesome with the concept of the great chain of being, was that there was an assumed further hierarchy separating human beings. It was, after all, the means by which monarchs derived their ruling authority. It was this deeper, fundamental view of hierarchy, held by early colonial societies, however, that allowed and enabled the horrendous treatment, and in some cases the ultimate genocide, of indigenous populations around the world. It was a fact that was not lost on H.G. Wells, who penned The War of the Worlds as a moral allegory to his native Britain, who at this point was sprawling towards its imperial climax and had been responsible for some of the worst of these crimes. This is pretty clear when you read The War of the Worlds preamble. We men, the creatures who inhabit this earth, must be to them, the Martians, at least as alien and lowly as are the monkeys and lemurs to us. And before we judge of them too harshly, we must remember that ruthless and utter destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals, such as the vanished bison and dodo, but upon its own inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of 50 years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? Interestingly, in describing the aliens' appearance and the shape and form of the Martians and their fighting machines, Wells evokes the form of an octopus-like creature. Now it could just be that if you're looking for something alien-looking, then you can't go past the octopus. But the use of an octopus was an established political trope or meme of the time in describing imperial and colonial empires, so it's hard to think this was just a coincidence on Wells' behalf. Moral allegory aside, the success of the War of the Worlds was due to the fact that it was just an engrossing, action-packed and highly entertaining story that also tapped into a lot of pre-war fears at the time. A lot of these fears were related to each other in that they all tended to derive from the same common anxiety caused by the rapid onslaught of technological change, or future shock. 
Fears that were not dissimilar to our own present day fears about the rapid pace and spread of technology such as AI and automation. Technology and global communication made the world smaller and turned it into a single system dramatically impacting upon the Victorian's experience of work and leisure. This coupled with the fact that the 19th century was drawing to a close and the new world of the 20th century was beckoning. This drew out the usual assortment of doomsdayers and apocalyptic evangelists. As a result, you had a population primed to have their imaginations and anxieties aroused. All this found expression in a form of literature popular at the time called invasion literature, which envisioned Britain being invaded by foreign armies, terrorists and the like. The most popular of which being the novel The Battle of Dorking, Reminiscence of a Volunteer, an account of an imagined imperial German invasion of England. The War of the Worlds was just an interesting take on this theme, with the invaders being extraterrestrial rather than terrestrial in nature. The growth in popularity of a particular genre of entertainment that reflects a population's anxiety is a common phenomena. For a more recent example, one only needs to look at the 90s with a proliferation of disaster movies that seem to reflect pre-millennial fears. Unfortunately for the Victorians and the rest of the world, these fears manifested in a reality when barely a decade into the new century, World War I broke out. A war in which old world Victorian values and ideals were smashed to pieces by the horrific reality of modern technology and industrialized warfare. In this regard, the War of the Worlds was to prove remarkably prophetic in the way it foresaw modern mechanized warfare and the concept of total war. Such as the use of gas, which the alien invaders use on the human population in the book. In some ways, these fears have been and remain universal. And it's for this reason that the War of the Worlds has stood the test of time. Wales was sufficiently vague in his description of the alien invaders that they can pretty much stand for anything. For Wales in the Victorian era, they were used as a surrogate to comment on imperialism. But as times changed, for other generations, the Martian invaders have been used as a metaphor for other things that more accurately reflect the fears and the anxieties of the time. So it isn't surprising that the most well-known adaptations have often come in times of great change or uncertainty. Leaving aside Jeff Wayne's musical edition, which could be argued came during the 1970s energy crisis, you have perhaps the most famous adaptation, which was Orson Welles' 1938 radio play, broadcast live on Halloween as a realistic dramatization. The episode became famous for allegedly causing widespread panic among its listening audience, though the scale of that panic is disputed. Whatever the truth may be, the fact is that fear and anxiety had become a way of life in the 1930s. The Great Depression had caused widespread poverty and social hardship, and the gathering crisis in Europe threatened to ignite into World War II. So, the War of the Worlds was just the thing to rattle jittery Americans. Similarly, when the first film adaptation of the book appeared in 1953, it struck a nerve with audiences in the grip of Cold War hysteria fueled by McCarthyism. An audience on edge caused by the perceived and constant threat of possible invasion by the Soviet Union. The red weed in the book taking on a non too subtle symbolic meaning. Interestingly, other than the Martian fighting machines, which are depicted as flying machines in the film because the special effects of animating tripods was too difficult and costly, the film differs significantly from the original novel in its attitude towards religion. This is most evident in the depiction of the clergyman as characters. The staunchly secularist Wells depicted a cowardly and thoroughly uninspiring curate, whom the narrators regarded with disgust. Whilst in the film, there is instead a sympathetic and heroic Pastor Collins who dies a martyr's death. And then the film's final scene in the church, strongly emphasizing the divine nature of humanity's deliverance, has no parallel in the original book. And in fact, it could be argued actually betrays the message of the book. This makes sense, however, given the importance of God in the US and its own nationalistic take on the great chain of being. A prism through which it sees itself and its place on the world stage 
particularly as during the Cold War, they were going up against an enemy in the form of the USSR, which had adopted a doctrine of state-sponsored atheism. Then in 2005, we see the emergence of Steven Spielberg's action blockbuster version starring Tom Cruise. Often underappreciated, the film reflects new millennial fears in the midst of the war on terror, with scenes and visions that tap directly into the consciousness of the audience, with images of 9-11 still fresh in the mind. The vague origins of the alien invaders standing in as a surrogate for the vague definition of the enemy in the overall war on terror. It's interesting to note, however, that one of the first buildings to collapse once the aliens attack is a church, which one can only assume was a tip of the hat to H.G. Wells. Spielberg's version also does an excellent job in reinforcing the sense of the chaotic breakdown of communications and social cohesion in the book, with the scariest moments often not involving the Martian invaders, but humans. So you can see how each generation has adapted the War of the Worlds to reflect its own fears and anxieties of the time, but in doing so, they habitually overlook the key to appreciating Wells's book, which was very much a comment on the ethics of seemingly advanced Victorian world at the height of its empire. A message that is as relevant now as it ever has been. The Victorian age may have passed, as all ages pass, with Britain's power diminished, but in a way, the empire never really ended. It just changed form. Whilst the musty old ideology of the great chain of being that affirms man's dominion over this world at the expense of all others that dwell with him upon it, found new acolytes in the seats of power, and if anything has experienced a resurgence with the growth of the evangelical movement and other forms of fundamentalism. What's more, the technological changes that have their origins in the 19th century have evolved dramatically through the 20th and now 21st, enabling us to conquer the natural world with ruthless efficiency. So much so, that like the invasive red weed in the book, there is hardly a corner of the earth where the tentacles of our sprawling civilization cannot be seen. In a way, we are the Martians. And throughout the book, H.G. Wells often draws comparisons. I began to compare the Martians to human machines, to ask myself for the first time in my life how an ironclad or steam engine would seem to an intelligent lower animal. The irony of the story is that technology is not what inevitably saves the human race. Rather, what defeats the Martians was something that has been there for longer than we have, the natural world, in the form of its smallest of creatures, bacteria. Many people have criticized this ending as being anticlimactic, but that is missing the point. As a biologist, Wells knew that contrary to the great chain of being, all life on Earth is connected and related to each other. The tiny plankton in the oceans form the basis of the marine food chain and provide half the ocean's oxygen. Lose them, and we all begin to starve and suffocate. Likewise, the tiny bees are critical pollinators. They pollinate 70 of the around 100 crop species that feeds 90% of the world. Lose them, and we may lose all of the plants that they pollinate, and all of the animals that eat those plants, and so on up the food chain. In the end, the War of the Worlds is as a parable about the limits of technology and the arrogance of man. A true classic that has not only entertained readers and audiences for well over a century, but challenged us to how we as a civilization might think of ourselves. If we do not heed the message, then we may be destined to share the same fate as the Martians.